Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Monster Farm Monday, uh, planning a fungicide program, 1st of February 2021. It's good to, to, to see you all or have you all there um, in this virtual world. Uh, my name is Richard Meredith. I head up the Arable Knowledge Exchange team at AHDB. And I've got the pleasure of being your chair this evening. So before we get into the main content of the evening, I'm just going to do the regulatory um, housekeeping slides uh, for you all. Uh, thanks, Christian. First of all, don't worry, you're all muted. We can't hear what you're saying. Um, so you said that that's all muted and there's no cameras on or anything. It's all one way, us talking talking to you. But then we do encourage you to ask questions. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, um, you'll see there's the questions box. Uh, a lot of the content of what we're doing tonight in the discussion we aim to have is driven by your own questions and own thoughts processes. So please do feel free to, to put them in. We've got we've designed the content to be around an hour long, and then we've got a window possibly of half an hour if we've got any um, questions that we want to get through. Um, if, if we go shorter than that, we'll, we'll draw it to a close when we need to. But we've got that window at the end to, to go through all of those, and I'll try and kind of chuck them in as we go through um, the main part of the session. If you, you're busy scribbling down notes or anything, just keep in mind um, that all these sessions are recorded. Um, you go the simplest way to go and watch them again is go to Google and type in HDB Serials Analyses YouTube, and then you see all the past um, webinars that we've done, uh, and, and you can find there and you can look back at the slides again. So, so don't worry too much about about that. Um, if you want to join the conversation on Twitter, there's the HDB um, Serials account, and there's, there's my Twitter handle there as well. Um, so if you do want to, to continue it on there afterwards, then please feel free to do so. I'm sure, sure most of our speakers tonight will be happy to join in the, the conversation. So finally, basis and Neuroso points. Um, please put those into the, the chat function. Um, for basis, it's your name, basis number, and your postcode. And for Neuroso, it's your, your name, your neuroso number, your date of birth, and your postcode. So just make sure you put those in. Uh, we've applied for the points, and we'll we'll send them off and get those in for you. Thanks, Christian. So, quick run through. The topic tonight is um, planning a fungicide strategy for for 2021. I'll be I'd be not doing my job if I didn't um, highlight the people at AHDB that uh, work in this area and they are there if you ever want to contact them or speak to them about any of the topics we're talking tonight or the AHDB research and the direction of that going forward. We're in a new kind of era at AHDB, a new strategy's um, gone out. The consultation for that closed yesterday, but the individual team members are still always happy to take direction on, on where you feel they should be going and what they could be doing to improve our work. We've got a new head of crop protection, that's Don Pendergrass, uh, and then the, the three guys really who, who are going to key to the serious analysis sector are Catherine Harries, who focuses on diseases, Charlotte Rowley, who does the pests, and Joe Martin, who does all of our weed work. Thank you, Christian. These guys, and we're going to be reflecting on a lot of it tonight, and Jonathan and Chloe, who made us on the, on the call, I'll introduce in a moment, they, they manage a lot of the, the fungicide performance work for us. You'll see here on this on this map, it shows you quite a few of the sites that, that we're operating from. Um, I think the main thing I want to draw, draw out from that is that everything that we're kind of talking about tonight, and generally when we're talking about fungicides at AHDB, is kind of the independent approach. Um, we put a bit of a disclaimer in here that we, if any of us slip up and mention a project name, we're not pushing any products here. Um, but we're, we're trying to be, be, be well behaved, but but in, in the generally, we're just trying to have a kind of a, an open discussion tonight. Um, so there's no, hopefully, no no commercial placement. Thank you, Christian. There's, as I mentioned there, the guys that manage the research. There's plenty going on. The best way to to kind of to see all that, the biggest kind of library for all of that is is the HDB website. Um, go to the fungicide performance um, section of it. It's always updated with the most relevant ones. But at the moment, we'll be having the last year's um, data will be on there, and you can see see on those on there. Thanks, Christian. And there's many tools, and the, and the, the main the fungicide performance fact sheet for that year is is also on the website. And we're just going to highlight here that the, the the use of farm bench and and how. If you're looking at um, uh, you, what you spend and what you do, farm bench is one of the key ways for for you to get involved and compare against your peers about what you're doing and um, how you perform. So, um, so please, if you do want to, to use that, um, get in touch with with the HDB. Thanks, Christian. Our strategic farms are fo having a big focus on on managed lower inputs, which kind of ties in the, to the discussion we're having uh, tonight. 
I've just put up here two examples, and that's in the, in the east and the west. And and um, I'm not expecting you to pick up all this now, but these are the, the strategies that they're they're trying in in fields of their own. Um, we we were obviously entering the, the growing season with the strategic farms. They'll be doing this over the, the coming spring, and then we'll be looking to communicate all that information over the summer, and then finally the results in in harvest uh, 2021. So watch this space. Thanks, Christian. We've got a strong network of monitor farms. So the the three farmer panelists on on the call tonight are either expert monitor farmers or current monitor farmers. Um, so we've got a, currently got a network of 23 monitor farmers across the country. Um, this sits this tonight's webinar sits in, in the middle of the the monitor farm Monday webinars that we've been doing. We obviously realise that getting you all together in a in a in an environment where we can discuss challenge and debate things in the usual monitor farm way that we encourage um would be preferable for us uh but with these sessions we're just trying to kind of tease out the the conversations um, and put them online for, for you to see and bring that expertise that we would do through the monitor farm program uh, we're getting asked a lot at the moment kind of our, our strategy going forward with 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 events and 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 meetings and I think the best way to describe it from from myself is is that um, we're we're very very kind of keen to be doing what we can within the scenario and the environment that we're in at the time. It's very hard to to, to kind of put a huge comment and a huge plan for for what we're doing, but we're just kind of we're looking and seeing what what we can do and um, and how we can do that going forward. Uh, the the web approach that we've taken over the winter has had an excellent uptake, and we really do see the place for that going for the future. But we won't be saying goodbye to goodbye to the old approach, um, the physical approach, um, by any means. Thank you, Christian. Don't worry, nearly there. The the cereals and oils seeds um, knowledge exchange team are really your eyes and ears on the ground. Um, these guys are your first port of call if you if you want to 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 have any conversations about anything AHDB. Um, if they don't know the answer to the question, then they can point you in the right direction and 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 help you along that journey. They really are the people at AHDB are really are a resource to for you all to use. So please don't don't shy away from that. Um, but I just thought I'd, I'd recognise that as as we went through. Thank you, Christian. So the Monitor Farm Mondays, um, like I said, weekly on a Monday. Um, we've got a few more coming up, and then then we go. We leave, give you a bit of peace while the spring work um, begins. Uh, next Monday, crop nutrition, and um, and then the week after that, we've got looking at grain marketing. We've tried to tailor the topics and um, our approach to these over over the season so that they're relative um, and, and reactive to, to to what you guys are thinking about and doing doing on farm at the time. Um, as always, with all these things, we we love and welcome and encourage feedback. Um, you'll get a feedback form at, at the end of this this webinar. But that team I just put up on the the map there. Don't ever be afraid to let them know kind of what you'd like to see and what you could do with with activity for, from AHDB. Um, we, we we'd always take that on. Uh, thank you, Christian. So right, that's me done rambling. I just need to introduce our panel, and we've got quite you can see quite a few pay, um, faces on on the the top of the screen there. Um, first of all, we've got our um, our experts in the in the the field of crop protection. That's Jonathan Blake and Chloe Morgan from from, from ADAS. Um, and then we've got our farmer panel of um, three farmers. Uh, Mark Wood was the previous Hereford Monitor farmer from 2014 to 2017, um, and had had the the misfortune of working with myself. And um, we've drawn Mark back in for for to. He, you can't get away from us. And Mark is actually a Series North Seeds board member as well, which we're very grateful for, for him taking his time. Um, that also means that he's another person that you can contact if you want to feed feedback of kind of the work of AHDB. Then we've got Tom Mead. Tom's our current AHDB Duxford monitor farmer over, over in the east in, um, in Cambridgeshire. Uh, Tom, Tom um, works um, at the Duxford monitor farm, obviously. Um, he and these guys are all going to introduce themselves and their business in a minute, so we'll come back to that. Then we've got another retired monitor farmer, uh, David Blacker. Dave is up, up in um, just outside York. Um, he was the monitor farmer um, for, for York in 2014 to 2017 as well. Last, by last point, by no means least, um, we've got Mark Topcliffe, who's my colleague um, in AHDB. Mark handles all the data that I mentioned earlier, kind of farm bench. We've got this huge data set of people putting in their information. 
and Mark manages that data and brings out the kind of key messages and draws out the key messages and conclusions um, that we can from those data and look at, looks at the trends. And that's what he'll be doing for us tonight. Thank you, Christian. So the plan for this evening is we're going to start off by having a discussion with the three farmers. And the point of having the three farmers tonight is really draw upon their regional differences and their regional focuses and what they're looking at on their businesses and what are the kind of challenges for them and what they're doing. So we're going to start off by talk, having a bit of a kind of a loose conversation about knowing and understanding and managing your, your diseases. And, and Jonathan's going to, going to respond to, to these guys and, and what their challenges are with the relevant information and some commentary from, from the, from the um, fungicide work, which, which he does. And we've encouraged our panel tonight to, to ask a few questions as we go through that are kind of topical and, and, and current to them. And then we'll start looking at, then we're going to move on to looking at the varieties and the, the other kind of risk factors, the varieties, the drilling date and the, and the seed rate. And then we're going to enter a bit of a discussion about the, the evolving risks. And the, the title of this, this webinar is Planning a Strategy for 2021. So we're just going to kind of pull together some of the things that kind of they, these guys all look at and what, what kind of they, do they monitor through the season? What discussions do they have with their agronomists and all, all such kind of things? And we've got a few kind of points that we were going to cover off there um, of the kind of evolving factors through, through a season to help plan a strategy. And then we're going to finish off by looking at the, the costs um, Chloe will kind of explain it a bit more, bit more later, but there's something called the fungicide margin challenge, which is a group of farmers that got together to look at how to get the, the best margin on a, from a, a fungicide um, program. And, and then finally, we've got my colleague Mark from HDB, and Mark's going to be showing us the, the bigger picture, the broader picture of all the, the farm bench data sets that are entered and, and looking, is there a, and not really asking the question, is there a trend between the kind of fungicide spend and the net margin and the yield response? And then we'll have the open Q&A session at the, at the end. Uh, thank you, Christian. But you've got one other small thing to mention is that um, we did a, a webinar in um, 2018, myself, Mark Wood and Jonathan Blake, it's one of the, I think it's the first one we ever did for HDB. Um, uh, that one, it's, it kind of com complements what we're doing tonight, but it's slightly different. In that webinar, we went through every single, um, each of the, the spray timings through the season and kind of had a look at what kind of consideration should, should a farmer be making when they're doing those timings. And I thought I'd just point that out now. It's on the HDB YouTube site. Um, it's really kind of another useful resource. We're looking to, to not me replicate that discussion. We're going to start something new. Um, tonight and have a, have a bit more of a different discussion there. I thought I'd just point that out in case anybody wanted to find that of interest. Thank you, Christian. I think that's all from the slides from me. So, right, let's, that's a bit of, bit of, a, bit of a mouthful. And, and um, I think what we're going to start off by doing, um, we loosely, loosely referred to this as the, the crop protection clinic. And each of the each of the farmers involved on, on this panel here are going to kind of give us some, some of their vital statistics. So kind of um, who they are, where they're from, uh, rainfall and the, their disease pressures. Um, so we're going to go through through the farmers. We're going to mark Tom, David, and then we're going to come to J Jonathan for some discussion points and some some kind of commentary um, going forward from from him. So Mark Wood, if I could come to you first and hand over to you for your 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 vital vital figures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, my vital statistics of uh, 30, 28, and 40. Um, <clears throat> to start with, um, down here in not so sunny Herefordshire at the moment, um, arable and beef farm farming around three and a half thousand acres. Around two thirds of our ground is uh, sandy loam, very quite light on the Ross Sands, and then you've got some more up toward much markle on the clay loams. Uh, standard arable rotation involving wheat, barley, peas, oats, and oilseed rape. Um, the agronomy here is all done uh, in house. Uh, wheat is our main uh, cash crop, uh, brings in our best margin on the whole. Our varieties at the moment, are we've moved on to Wolverine, the old favourites of Graham and Costello, and we're also growing some mixed days as well. I've uh, been asked about the rainfall that we have. Our long-term average is 734 mils over the last uh, 30 years. Um, the last two years, we've averaged exactly the same at 930. So we've had two very wet years but that doesn't explain everything through the disease um, that we've seen on the crops. It's very much come at different times of the year. Our main disease pressure that we have here is septoria, 
we know we're going to get septoria every year being over in the west and being a bit wetter we find the other diseases can be managed we don't get the the pressure of the rusts of the the boys over east and anything else we can we can control so it's septoria is key to us it's just how bad it is going to be through the year over to tom thank you mark over to tom yeah. Yeah, so I'm uh, Tom Mead, farm in uh, South Cambridgeshire and, and one of the Duxford Monitor Farmers. Um, I noticed it's the Farm Excellence Programme. I definitely don't class myself as an excellent farmer or an expert in fungicides, but um, if we're here to set some simple farmer questions. Um, I don't record our, our rainfall um, personally, but our average is sort of anywhere between sort of 550 and 600 mils a year. Um, generally here in the east rainfall is our limiting factor with a lot of our crop yields um, growing uh, wheat varieties skyfall gleam inciter and gravity um, I should probably say we farm about 300 hectares um, some light sandy soils and then some on some more chalky soils which are a bit more moisture retentive um, and then opposite to mark um, you know, our perceived um, biggest risk probably would be yellow rust, but I think we're going to come into the question of, you know, quite how big a deal that is. Um, and still septoria, even though it's dry, it's not necessarily about the total rainfall we have, but but when we have it. So be interested to um, see what Jonathan's thoughts are on that. Um, I did my basis qualification about 10 years ago. Um, so I've got some knowledge of um, fungicides, but we also use some independent advice for agronomy as well. Thank you, Tom. Dave. Uh, yeah, David Blackett. I'm um, farming in, uh, just north of York, in the Vale of York, of uh, Farmer and contractor, um, growing mainly growing wheat, beans, and rape uh, for all first wheat. I don't grow second wheat anymore. Uh, soil types are a bit all over the place. I've got I've got some heavy clay and some blow away sand and everything in between that, and most of it in the same field. Um, uh, varieties are. Um, been growing growing shabras now for uh, probably four years each, uh, and uh, grew a bit of extase last year, and I've got quite a bit of extase in the ground again this year. Um, uh, Rainfall-wise, uh, you could probably capture what we get between 650 and 750. Uh, so not nothing compared to a lot of the time what the West get, but um, when you when your land doesn't drain particularly well, it looks like you've had twice as much, and it seems to come in 200 mil dollops all at once. Uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Jonathan, over to you. Kind of, the, there's a bit of a mixed bag there in kind of what they're doing and what they're dealing with. Um, I, I'm kind of going to hand over discussion to you for the moment now. To kind of, do you want, is it easiest to go through start start off with with Mark and then work through through Tom and, and Dave? That makes sense. Actually, uh, Christian, would you mind just sharing screen uh, or other uh, putting me so I can share my yep. screen? I'll pass you now. Oh, sorry, uh, bear with. There we go. Thank you. Hopefully, um, that should be coming up shortly. I'm fortunate enough to have had some prior notice of what varieties uh, Mark, Tom, and David are, are all growing. Um, so uh, I thought it would be worth just pulling it into a simple spreadsheet that hopefully you can see now, can you? Brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah. Mark, you mentioned um, Gray and Wolverine, Shabras, Costello, X Days. You know, you're over in the West, aren't you? I mean, it's completely understandable why you're looking at those varieties, reasonably resilient uh, or resistant to Septoria, um, as much as varieties are. Wolverine's perhaps the, the, the notable exception. I think the uh, RL last year had a better rating for that than it did this year in that respect. Um, but um, when you look through those varieties, um, there are a couple of slightly disturbing um, elements, uh, Wolverine and Shabras. Uh, did you say Shabras was on the yours, Mark, actually? I wonder if that might be copy across. Uh, no, I haven't got Shabras. That's, yeah, forgive me, that's a, uh, that shouldn't be in there. But Wolverine um, has actually been rated a five for yellow rust. So although you would see um, Septoria as your main target, I would be nervous of that variety. Um, it is known to get yellow rust. Uh, it's quite prolific in that variety. 
Um, so, whereas we can usually control the other rust, uh, we're worth keeping an eye on that because that's a new variety. We don't quite know how, uh, how well uh, that might be taken by that pathogen. Um, in terms of others, uh, yeah, you've chosen the more resistant Septoria, but again, actually, Wolverine um, was recently downrated on Septoria. I think it was it was a six or more in the initial lists, um, but it's actually a 5.3. So that might be your, your troublesome variety of the set you have there, Mark. Um, one, so watch out, because I'm presuming you've sown that quite early, uh, given that it's uh, got BYDB resistance, and I guess black grass isn't a problem with it is further east. Um, so if we then have a look at what Tom is going. Sorry, go on. Go, go, go say, Mark, would you agree with that? That the reason for growing Wolverine is purely for early drilling on some of our sandy ground that doesn't drill so well later. With the loss of deter, we were pushing ourselves back to a start date of the 20, 25th of September, which was becoming troublesome, which uh, suits our sandy ground to get some in early. We know we're going to have to probably go a little bit stronger on that disease protection, but it gives us that head start so we can actually get things planted in the autumn. Yeah. So... <clears throat> That earlier planting will accentuate that septoria risk factor um, and potentially make that uh, yeah, even more troublesome. If we go on to Tom briefly and have a look at what he's growing, Skyfall Gleam and Cytor and Gravity. I mean, I can see why you've got Yellow Rust as a challenge, Tom, uh, because the varieties you're growing are, are challenging varieties. You've got a, a three in Skyfall a Gleam and in Cytor, quite new varieties, certainly. Uh, known to get considerable amounts of yellow rust. Um, I think that's slightly less than uh, in situ, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I guess varietal choice is partly what's determining your risk there. Um, but um, of the other aspects around that variety, brown rust in situ can be a little bit susceptible as well. Um, and uh, of all of the varieties you've got, gravity is the one I'd watch out for from a septoria perspective. Uh, at 4.9, I mean, we use that in trials in the West sometimes to to maximise disease pressure. And that's never a good sign uh, when it comes to varietal choice. It does mean it is quite susceptible. Um, not quite as bad as um, one or two others. I think um, uh, there is um, barrel and uh, maybe a little, ah, it's gone. Elation, sorry, uh, would be worse, but um, not much. Um, when it comes to what David's growing, does that sort of make sense in terms of what your perceived threats are, Tom? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we, we know that then um, the yellow rust is a is a um, an issue that we need to watch, but we're picking those varieties on on other attributes. And if there's, you know, there's always generally one weak link or or more in in um, varieties. And for us, it's about consistency. I mean, we have still been growing, you know, mm. Santiago up until last year and had fantastic consistency of yield um so yeah it's i think that's where the scores are good for for knowing your your threats but there's so many other things to put into the mix with that as well yeah it's easy to forget that i mean santiago is a great case in point consort before that as well there are varieties that uh, for all reasons well, what varieties you shouldn't have grown but quite frankly always outperformed the expectations and uh, um david uh, graham shabras x days you're going the very um um disease resistant route from a septoria angle here. Um, is that your main focus? I, I presume that, that is why uh, we've got a 16 uh, route. In... Yeah, yeah, it was it was up there on the consideration. I'm still looking for varieties that uh, not only have good disease score, but good yielding and uh, reasonably early to harvest. You know, we, right, we're right. Yes, to always, harvesting always a couple yeah. of, yeah, it is a factor for me. And these all seem to work well when I'm strip drilling as well. They all, um, they all cope with it and fill out um the strips better than a lot of varieties i've tried right uh the ones i'd, I'd watch I mean, I'd, some of you might notice i didn't highlight the brown rust um in the graham and shabras here I mean, i'm guessing where, where you are in the country david brown rust isn't a major problem no we've never really seen brown rust for years no it's always yeah. it's always we know we're going to get septoria that's always going to be there it just depends on the weather and how bad we get it and um Yellow rust, generally we see that quite a bit. Uh, brown rust we've not had. Um, eye spot is one that um, has been quite quite noticeable for two or three years, but never got to any 
um, any level of disease that you, you would worry about too much. You know, it's never really got into the stem. It's always been on the outside of the leaf. So, but it is there. You can find it quite. I, it has driven my decision at T1 to I mean, what product to use to some extent. Mm. Um, it's never been. Sorry, go. No, it's never. It, Icebox never never come out. You know, in the last certain last five years or six years, to be you know something you should be panicking about. Yeah, whether I spot penetrates is, is often an interesting um, thing. Rainfall through May is, is critical to, for um, stems to be penetrated. And we have a lot of varieties out there at the moment. They're rated threes or fours for bright spot resistance. And one of my fears actually is a, a wet May. Uh, we haven't had a wet May as we're coming to a moment uh, for a while. And should we have one, I fear what might be on the outside of the sheath may end up inside and uh, actually affect the stems. Um, but um, I think it's fair to say across all the varieties you've got in the ground, septoria is a pretty big challenge, if not the biggest that you're facing. Um, so I think Tom was the only one that sort of uh, thought yellow rust was perhaps the, the bigger uh, disease to, to manage. Um, and we've actually been looking at this, and it would be remiss of me not to mention a piece of work we've been doing um, for the last five years, looking at how fungicide inputs could change with, um, or how the optimum fungicide program might alter with varieties. Um, so I just wonder if it'd be worth as a point of interest and uh, perhaps uh, a talking point, just sharing what we found from that and then coming back to a wider discussion on that. Um, I might at this point hand over to you, bring my screen back on. Um, Chloe's actually been managing this project for the last um, three years. Uh, so you're happy to, Chloe, for you to, to present this. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I can go through this. Um, this is a project that's been running for the last five years called Combining Agronomy, Variety and Chemistry to Maintain Control of Septoria Triticae in Wheat, funded by AHDB and BASF. And we work with a number of different partners such as SIUC, NIAB, Cheggers and UCD. So the project, the trials started in 2016 and the final trials were in 2020. Um, so we just got to the next slide. This project is now coming to the end as we're um, writing the final report, which is due at the end of March. The project looked at different factors that could influence septoria triticae and how these different factors could then be utilised as more of an integrated pest management um, design. So one factor we looked at was varieties. We had three varieties with different septoria susceptibility. We also looked at sowing date. We had mid-September and mid-October and seed rates. We looked at targeting different plant populations to generate different canopy sizes and see what effect that had on septoria. On top of that, we also applied four different fungicide treatments. Um, so we had an untreated, which was pretty, yeah, an untreated uh, for comparison, and then a low, medium and high strategy, which built from a chlorothaminal base. We added Brutus, which is an azole, and then in the high strategy, we added Imtrex, which is the SCHI. Um, I appreciate chlorothanol is no longer available, but these were designed just to represent a low, medium and high strategy um, rather than focus too much on the actual products that were used. Um, so on the next slide, we looked at some of the weather factors in this trial and I just sort of highlight this as Jonathan briefly mentioned. You can see the rainfall that we've had during the project over the last five years. Uh, the top graphs is April and the bottom is May. Um, and these are taken from the Met Office and they show the variation from the 30 year mean for each month. Um, so blue is above average, white is about average and brown is below average. As you can see, April has a bit of variation across the years, um, fairly average in 2016, below average in 2017, 19 and 20, um, but above average in 2018. Um, so it's all about variation there. In May, Actually, it's been very similar across all five years, with the exception of 2020 being very dry. Um, it's been about average or below average for most areas of the UK. And these two months are really the most influential periods for septoria. You splash rainfall up onto the top three yield forming leaves um, and therefore impact your yield. 
if you get rain during this period. And as Jonathan mentioned, it's been quite dry really across April and May. Um, so we haven't really seen what we call a very high pressure season yet. Uh, whether this is due to climate change and this is the new norm, um, or whether it's just by chance is, is yet to see. So we'll move on to the next slide. We should show you just a quick snippet of some of the results, but obviously there'll be more detail in the final report. Um, so this just shows the average response across all site seasons in 21 different sites. And here we're looking at least three septoria at E2 plus three to four weeks. The effect of seed rate we've seen has been least effective um, in terms of or had the least impact on septoria. So here we're focusing on sowing date variety and fungicide. The mid-September sown treatments are on the left and the mid-October on the right. And we're looking at percent severity of septoria. If you focus on the blue bars first, those are the untreated bars in each situation. We've got the three different varieties at each sowing date. You can see the clear effect of variety, reducing the disease levels and reflecting the varietal resistance at both sowing dates. You can also see a clear effect of sowing date looking at the untreated bars in the blue. The bars on the right are lower than the bars on the left, so much so that a susceptible variety sown in mid-October is fairly comparable to a moderately susceptible variety sown in mid-September. So if you happen to have drilled in mid-October compared to mid-September, you are reducing the disease pressure in your crop. So it's important to tailor your fungicide strategy to your situation. As you can see, in a susceptible variety sown in mid-September, you get a response from all three fungicide inputs. In a susceptible variety sown in mid-October, that response is smaller, and not much difference between the medium and high strategy. And if you sown a moderately resistant variety in mid-October, see in this case the treatments uh, between the different fungicides are very small, the difference is small. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really interesting project and the report for this will be out soon uh, with more detail. So I'll hand you back to Jonathan on that night. Thank you Chloe, yeah, now as you can see it, it's clearly uh, we've got a project there that's quite clearly showing this strong link between sowing date and variety but also between variety and uh, the amount of input required to control disease. Uh, and actually it's one of my biggest fears um, for the season ahead is based on the met data that Chloe has just shown. Um, over the last three or four or even five years, uh, we haven't had conditions in the spring that have been really conducive to disease. Mark touched on it a moment or two ago when he said the total rainfall for the last two years have been over 900 mils. Um, but I think as you rightly said, Mark, it was rainfall at other points in the season that was driving that number. Um, actually, the rainfall through uh, April and May, those key months for diseases, as Chloe rightly mentioned, um, was low and lower than we would normally expect, considerably lower. And I guess we're often guilty a little bit of farming um, last year rather than the year that we're in. Um, and I wonder if we're getting into a position where we've got a bit of a full sense of security on septoria. We haven't had a what a pathologist would call a proper epidemic for a year or two. Um, and it can happen. And it only has to be average or more than average to be worse than the last two or three years in terms of rainfall. Um, my other concern is there's a lot of information out there this year that shows how well products performed last year. And if you've looked at the AHDB fungicide performance curves, for instance, they all show that you know, products worked very well last year. One hesitation with that is the population monitoring, the monitoring that's done in the laboratories that takes isolates um, and checks on how well, how sensitive they are um, to different modes of action, in this case, SDHIs, quite clearly shows that in 2020, the line took a further step to the right. That effectively means it became, the population is becoming less sensitive to SDHIs. So they may have performed well last year. That may have just been a, a, a feature of a season when it wasn't very conducive to disease, uh, an easier target under uh, those conditions perhaps. Um, but I'm really quite concerned that if we have a more normal season, the population having shifted could put us in a situation where we've got high pressure. Just going back to the varieties you're growing and, and those that are particularly steptoria prone, I just wanted to put this up to show what AHDB data, this is the first time I've shared this one, shared this one actually, so uh, I'll talk you through it. On the left-hand side, you've got gravity, in the middle, you've got Graham, on the right-hand side, you've got X-Days. 
Um, each color or each bar represents a different year for each of those varieties. That bar reflects the yield response to disease control, the average for that variety, and the error bar reflects the highest and lowest uh, response to disease control um, during that year. So gravity on the left-hand side there, it's got an average yield response in 2017 of 3.4. And you can see that the lowest yield response, this is across the eight or 10 sites that the OHTB runs every year where they've got both treated and untreated yield. The lowest was just over two tons and the highest just just under just over five and four and a half. Um, and you can see it has varied considerably from one year to the next. Uh, the lowest yield response in all of the AHDB sites uh, was in 2020 uh, when gravity gave us just about um, just under a ton to the hectare on those sites. Uh, but you know, gravity is predominantly driven by sectorial. That's why I put these in. Uh, forgive me, Tom, if I put the other rust in, the numbers would be twice the size and it's a, perhaps a more controllable pathogen. But um, you can see I've kept the axes the same left to right. Uh, and you can see the bars are all a little bit low when it comes to grain, a more resistant variety. But even on that variety, you've got instances within the AHDBRL data where Graham has given us um, a four or even a four and a half ton yield response to treatment. So it can happen when conditions are conducive um, and good for yield, I guess, as well, because high yielding crops tend to pull out those differences more. But note again, 2020. Okay, yes, there was one site where grain gave us over a three ton yield response, but on average, it was just over a ton to the hectare. X days, well, there is a little bit more security in that variety. and. I guess um, one of the questions that often comes up when it comes to dealing with this, or that question of how much do I spend, is um, how much do I get back? And you have to judge that as best you can based on the season and the variety you're growing and the position you're growing is in. But certainly with X days, the overall yield response is, is no more than around about a ton to the hectare in possibly three quite quiet seasons. But do note, you know, I think that was Cowbridge um, that uh, got up to, I think it, it might have been Wadebridge actually down in Devon, another bridge, um, got over three tons, just about three tons on X days in 2019. So it's not impossible that you can get significantly big yield responses in those more resistant varieties when conditions favor that. The only other thing I wanted just to touch on Yeah, the rust. Sounds like the dog's got an opinion as well. <laughs> My apologies. Yes, no, they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite good at interrupting me. Um, a little bit yeah. on the other rust. I mean, the three drivers last year were race, um, the weather in the spring because it was a warm winter and sowing days. Uh, and um, when we just look at the agronomic factors affecting yellow rust. Um, Big Ladders did some work on this and it was really instructive and counterintuitive. The view is often that um, sowing date um, or earlier sowing promotes disease, and that is true for septoria, but it is not true uh, when it comes to yellow rust. Um, it's the other way around. Uh, and actually, uh, later sowings tend to have more yellow rust uh, during that key yield forming period. And it's related to. Um, plant age as much as anything else. Um, the other aspect that they picked on was frosts. And uh, last year was bad because we had quite a low level of frost through the uh, winter generally. Um, but this winter, perhaps it's a little bit higher. Number of frosts below minus five is critical. And this is all about leaf survival, that lower leaf survival. This time of year, yellow rust is clinging to the bottom of the plant. Um, and if it's lucky, it gets a chance to um, cycle up onto the more uh, recently emerged leaves. Uh, sometimes that's not the case though, and if you have a series of uh, sharper frosts that clear out those low leaves, those low leaves die off. It never actually cycles up onto the um, leaves that are emerging. So that was probably about enough for me to share at this stage. I was just going to uh, end slideshow at that and perhaps uh, come back to 
of the room. Um, shared a little bit of information on the other Ruston Septoria there. Um, I wonder whether Mark, Tom, David, what your thoughts are, and whether you, know, you have any questions from for me from that. Should we share that order, Mark, Tom, David? No, I think uh, everything Jonathan um, uh, has said is very accurate. I do think that um, probably the that we've had some beneficial weather for lower disease, especially with the septoria. But there's been a real move towards higher uh, disease resistance, resistance varieties. So um, I think the pressure is less. People are managing it after a few bad years, five or six years ago. So the breeders have responded with those sorts of plants. Once you get to stays in the ground, it gives you another management tool. Um, I'd agree with what Richard said about, um, uh, or Jonathan, sorry, said about the uh, lessons from last year. We always farm for last year. But I think we need to learn lessons from last year, but not completely change strategy. There's still the, the core values of a fungicide strategy are still there. They don't change. Uh, the weather will change and we can learn lessons from the year before. Tom? Yeah, I, um, I've just written down there, um, just before Jonathan said it, learning the false sense of security from some dry years. Um, certainly in, in the east, well, I know there was, you know, last year everybody was delayed drilling, but you know, we've been in the same situation here when we would have liked to have been drilling a bit earlier, but actually, you know, lots of, you know, ours has been mid-October onwards and lots of people have been the back end of October. So, our, you know, it's perhaps lowered our disease pressure. Um, and just, you know, to reiterate what I, how I sort of your yield response curves, that actually a sensible spend on fungicides is a heck of a good insurance policy um, to ensure all the rest of the costs that you've put on that crop. Um, you know, and that's proven generally year in, year out. That's not to say we shouldn't look at cleaner varieties. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think there's a risk of going too far the other way and, and trying to be too, um, you're playing with fire, really, I think, if you're, if you're really um, cutting fungicides back um, dramatically, because, um, you know, the risk is, is big then. Yeah, I agree. Um, when it comes to margin over fungicide costs, you always lose out more by under applying than you do by over, you always get an incremental increase in yield if you over apply that compensates a little bit for that uh, increase in spend. So I'd agree with you on that. I think uh, you're better missing high. Thanks, uh, Tom. Dave? Uh, yeah, well, certainly what I think I've taken away from that, if I understood it right, if, so if you're drilling, uh, drilling a late crop, it, that's more susceptible to yellow rust. So if I'm drilling, um, very resistant septoria variety really early i've got the best of both worlds there from a septoria point of view and a yellow rust point of view we've got a few questions coming coming in here and there's one on similar similar vein that keeps on popping up so i'm going to ask the panel now um i'll do it different to do um good tom if you don't mind my coming to you first um how do you propose to um how do you intend to control septoria now that we've lost ctl uh, that's going to be one of my questions to Jonathan, how much of an issue well, that's there we go, going then. to be. Um, Jonathan, what would your advice be? What would my advice be on, on what to do now we've lost chlorothalonil? Well, there are other multi-sites, um, and we shouldn't ignore them. I think it's been easy to dismiss the likes of um, Mankazeb and Folpet in recent years. Um, actually, just one on this, Christian, could you bring up um, slide two of my set? Um, it's been easy to dismiss them because they've been more expensive and less efficacious than chlorothalonil. Chlorothalonil has been a very easy addition, um, and it's probably provided us a six or eight fold return on our investment. Um, and perfect, thank you. Um, Polpet and Mancazeb, I, I put them in a similar category because I think the uh, percent control you get from one or the other um, does um, alternate depending on which trial you look at. I've seen somewhere Mancazeb looks better, I've seen somewhere Polpet looks better. Um, they both won't provide the same level of control. Probably at best looking at something between um, 50 and 60 percent of what we might have had from a litre of cloth amyl. The Dot lower down on this, uh, apologies, there's no legend here, but the dot is Bravo, the uh, diamond lower down on that screen. The red line is the dose response to full pet over a, 
three year period between 2012 and 2014. This is AHDB fungicide performance data and shows um, where Folpet sits alongside that. And you can see uh, actually 100% dose, that's a litre and a half of Folpet, costs something in the order of nine pounds a litre, so that's about 13 and a half pounds uh, for that full dose of Folpet, compared to Bravo, which was around six, five or six pounds a litre. And that was 50% was a litre. So I mean, you can see um, clearly it's not going to do as much. But if Bravo was providing a six to eight fold return on our investment, uh, it's possible Folpet may still be providing an economic return, likely in fact. And, and that's pretty much what we're seeing. Uh, it's still a useful addition. Um, it's taking people a while to adjust to the concept, uh, but I think we need to. Uh, because uh, it is still a multi-site and uh, that, that um, can help to protect newer chemistry and it can do that whilst improving your margin of fungicide costs as well I would say so yeah I would say you um you send farmers ignoring it but until now if if um chlorothanolol was going to be a lot cheaper and provide a lot more control why would we have looked at it before before we needed to no, you're absolutely right there was no point looking at it before uh, and just you mentioned earlier about the um, effectiveness of SDHIs. Um, do we need to be ensuring that they're going on in a preventative um, way, you know, even more so now in terms of protecting them without chlorothanolol with the less effectiveness of full pet or Manxeb? Indeed, yeah, we do have less um, protectant uh, capability. And um, I guess we're probably not going to look to change our timings. But to be making sure we're in a protecting scenario and you know we'll push more people down the route of using an SDHI azole at T1, I'm sure, um, because we don't have the level of efficacy that we would have always had. Um, very true. Yeah. It's not just um, CTL though, is it, Jonathan? We've lost a foxy as well. And if you took CTL and a foxy out of my spray program, it leaves two great big gaping holes. Um, that surely that's just going to put more and more pressure onto the remaining chemistry we've got, and they're going to we're going to see um, resistance septoria drifting faster than we would have done. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, like chlorothalonil, I can see has, has ripped a hole in, in our septoria control, and we're trying to patch that up as best we can with some either with chemistry that's a little bit less efficacious, or, or with a uh, single site modes of action that, if anything, are sliding in their efficacy. Um, but with regard to epoxy, um, I'm not sure that's been quite as damaging to our situation. Uh, its activity on septoria had waned. Uh, it was probably providing us with 30 or 40 percent control in a protectant scenario at best, uh, or is rather still now, because um, you can use it up until the end of October if you're still going in stock. Um, but in terms of septoria activity, it, it's been superseded, I think, by the likes of methane trifluconazole, the new azole from BSF, which is considerably more active on septoria. Uh, and proline is still there that has a similar level of efficacy to what epoxy had. The one advantage that epoxy had was on yellow rust. Uh, it's a very strong yellow rust active. But I think you can get quite close with other chemistries like tebuconazole. Um, will provide quite similar level of control to epoxy. But I think you can control the other rust without epoxy, and its role on septoria has been less. But uh, yeah, no, I think um, yeah, that's about where I'd see it. Could I just oh. um, come back? Uh, Tom said earlier that uh, by reducing fungicides, you're playing with fire. I agree the margins are there for fungicides, and it's a great insurance policy. But I see it as a bit of an opportunity because we're losing more and more of these chemicals. Last year it was Bravo, then there's epoxy, the SDHIs are waning, and we've got to learn ways to manage crops without just relying on the chemicals all the time. They're a good insurance policy, but we're losing them, so we need to use them smarter and almost as the final insurance policy in a program which involves varieties mm -hmm. and sowing date and, and everything else. So I see it as an opportunity the last couple of years to learn what we can do, what we can get away with, what we can't, and try and learn those lessons. I think, I think unfortunately, one of the messages we're going to get is that we can't rely on real delayed drilling now. Because the last two seasons have meant if you delay drill, you don't, you don't drill. 
I think that's going to put a lot of nervousness in all of us. I agree, David. I mean, delayed drilling um, is probably not something you'd have specifically done for disease control, but probably more likely for, for weed management. But uh, um, yeah, you can't rely on it, as you say. Um, and um, I think, yeah, it's worth bearing in mind the impact that delayed drilling has on your disease management program. Um, but I probably wouldn't suggest people um, switch to later sowings in order to control disease, whilst we still have chemistry that can. I think your better tool, I think what Mark was perhaps getting at more, was, was using varieties in that way to, to manage our disease pressure. Um, and possibly by using sowing date with that, and, and what you were talking about by sowing your most susceptible variety latest and your most resistant variety earliest, uh, within assuming all other, all other things being equal, of course, um, is a logical step in, in that process. So changing the, pushing it to an extreme, there is a, a school of thought out there that we don't need fungicides anymore. That certain companies are saying, we just pay attention to trace elements and apply a biostimulant or two, um, and then we won't need to apply any fungicides. Is this just clever marketing or what are Jonathan's thoughts on this? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I might bring Chloe in, in a moment because I know you've been doing some work on biostimulants a little bit, haven't you? Uh, but um, not that I'm wanting to put you on the spot. It's a, it's a very complicated picture between um, nutrients and disease. Uh, it's it. In general, nutrients promote disease because the most limiting nutrient in all of our soils is nitrogen. That's why we apply the quantity we do. Um, and almost without fail, the addition of earlier nitrogen or nitrogen of any form to a crop increases green leaf area, increases crop biomass, uh, and increases uh, disease uh, considerably in the case of septoria. Uh, but it also promote yellow rust and brown rust. Um, so the more we put nitrogen on, the worse our disease levels. There is uh, quite a lot of talk around biostimulants and micronutrients and so forth. And there is some evidence uh, in some cases, I think you know, one clear one is um, that if you have powdery mildew and you're manganese deficient, adding manganese will reduce the problem that you have with mildew. There's a clear link between pathogen and manganese deficiency. And I think that's one of the few cases I, I've come across where there is such a link. Um, Claims made by manufacturers of biostimulants will try to point towards um, research that they've done. But from all I've seen, I think if you were considering replacing a fungicide with a biostimulant, uh, you'd be putting yourself at greater risk of much more significant yield loss more directly from disease. Because I think any impact that any biostimulant has on disease, on the key folio diseases of wheat at least, is likely to be very small. Chloe, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on that. No, I think I'd agree. I did a small plot trial this year with biostimulants. Um, we didn't see any significant differences in any of the products, um, but that was one trial in one season. I know wider within ADAS, I know our physiology team have done a bit more work on it, uh, but at the, uh, the moment results seem quite mixed. Um, I think we need to learn more about biostimulants and what situations they give the most benefit um, rather than just applying them and seeing what happens really. We need to understand them a bit more um, and, and how they're affecting our crops to be able to use them to, the, to their full potential. I think I'd agree with that. Point. Gonna... Sometimes as, as farmers, we're, we're told, you know, this biostimulant is going to do this, that and the other. And then you say, how does it work? And someone says, well, I don't really know. Well, that, you know, at least with chemistry, we do have some science behind it. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more to learn and find out how to use them properly. Yeah, I'm reluctant to no, 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 for a conversation, but I think what we will do now, we've got absolutely hundreds of questions coming in, and I'm, I'm worried about the latter half of this. So I think what we'll do now is give Jonathan, give your, your voice a rest just for, for um, 10 minutes while we go over to look at the kind of cost element, and then we're going to hit the Q&A session hard and kind of get, go, through, go through all those, because there's quite a few um, excellent questions coming in for, for yourself and for the panel. So Chloe, um, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage. 
uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, Chloe runs the uh, program that with with AHDB, and it's loosely tied to all the monitor farm um, programs um, that we call the the fungicide margin challenge. And that's really looking at kind of how do you make the best margin out of um, it, out, out of your approach. Chloe's going to talk us through how how that works and what the the winning kind of touch was and what the conclusions were for for these done. So Chloe, I won't tell on you anymore. Over to you. Thanks. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, we thought this was a good opportunity to share some results from the ADAS and AHDB Monitor Farm Fungicide Margin Challenge. Um, so the challenge was set up because crop profitability depends on maximising margins rather than just pushing for yield alone. And in 2020, we invited three monitor farm groups to compete in the Fungicide Margin Challenge, using innovative strategies against one another, against an ADAS expert programme and an untreated crop in a replicated plot trial. And the aim of this was to achieve the highest margin over fungicide cost. So how this works was we located plot trials in uh, a field in each region. The host farmer applied all nutrients to that area except for fungicides. So the only thing we changed was the fungicide program. Each of our entrants were assigned some plots and to those they designed their own fungicide program based on updates from ADAS on how the crop was developing and what diseases were present. They decided their program a week before each application was due to be applied, so it was um, able to change it during the season. And all plots were monitored for disease and harvested. So as I've already mentioned, 2020 was a very abnormal season, uh, poor sowing conditions, and we hit quite a serious drought in April and May. Um, and as a result, overall, it was a low disease pressure season, with low levels of septoria. Uh, there was some yellow rust about, particularly due to the warm temperatures, um, in susceptible varieties. Um, I'll quickly run through, I'll briefly run through each trial um, just to give you the key results. So the first was the Wales and West site, kindly hosted by Mark Wood. So this was a crop of Graham drilled on the 20th of September. So in the west of the UK, relatively early sown, um, but despite that, given the season, we saw very low levels of septoria, um, and septoria was the main disease. So we jump straight to the results. The bars here are the yield results and the orange spots are the margins. I've ranked these by margin. You'll see that the untreated did win in this case, in this one trial. Um, and that's due to the low levels of disease that we saw in this crop. You can see a relatively small yield response of 0.5 tonnes per hectare between the untreated and the Mark Woods entry. Uh, Mark did come in first place after the untreated. Um, but yeah, we didn't, in this case, the entry came out first because of low disease pressure and also it was on the sandy loam site. So it did drought off towards the end of the season and didn't, didn't retain its GLA. But you see different fungicide programs. We've, I've colour coded them based on the number of applications. So the light blue bars are two sprays, the dark blue are three sprays, and the purple are four. And you can see all the two spray programs stacked up the higher rankings. Um, the four, four and three spray programs at the bottom there, achieving the lowest margins uh, due to the fact that there was a small, quite a small yield response in this trial. So I've just pulled out the top four fungicide programs and um, just to briefly summarise them. You can see both Mark, Entrance 16 and 12 were all a two spray programme. And then our experts were after that with a three spray programme. Everyone dropped the T naught. Um, I've put the spend there. That cost includes the cost of the fungicides and application cost of £14 per hectare per fungicide application to reflect just the farm cost of applying these fungicides. You can see they all had a, quite a similar spend. Entrant 12 was actually the lowest spend of the trial at £87.40. Um, and then it goes up to Entrant, entrant 16, which is 108. The highest spend was 137 of the trial. Um, and as you can see, the yields were fairly similar across those four treatments, given the low yield potential. Kerry, can I quickly, um, while we've got the benefit of having Mark with us here, Mark, can I ask you kind of your approach to this um, as a winner for for the group, apart from the untreated, obviously? Um, did you were you braver than you usually are with your with your approach to the fungicide challenge? Um, yes, slightly braver than what we normally do. Um, wanted to try out uh, without we weren't allowed CTL, and I uh, wanted to start looking at what we use instead. Um, I tried to treat what was there, and when there wasn't much there, uh, we didn't. So at uh, 
T1, slightly concerned. Um, want to get some Prothiconazole on just in case of the eye spot being Graham, having low eye spot, just in case that came through. And T2, we still stuck with a reasonably good product just to uh, have the greening effect and if there was any late uh, um, septoria coming in. So that was a bit of an insurance policy. At T3, couldn't see any potential coming from applying anything more. So held back on that. Thank you, Mark. Back to you, Chloe. Thanks. Um, so I'll move on to well, the conclusions of that site that we have saw. Yeah, low disease pressure. So in, in this site, there was no significant benefit from applying the fungicides on yield or margin. And in this case, if you spent less, you did get more back in terms of your margin. Obviously, this is quite an extreme example. Um, I won't recommend that you do leave your crops untreated. Uh, 2020 was a difficult year, but I think it does show that there is some movement in fungicide programmes and it's important to tailor them to the season in order to maximise your margins. The next site was in East Anglia, kindly hosted by Tom Mead, and this was a crop of gravity drilled on the 16th of October. So east of the UK now, yellow rust is perhaps more of an issue over there. In terms of disease, we saw very low levels of septoria. Um, we did two assessments and we didn't pick up any yellow rust in the assessments. But it was seen at the T2 application. Um, so I think it was present in the field and actually had a large part to play, although we didn't see much of it. In terms of results, in this case, the untreated was much lower down the rankings. Um, and you can see we've got a range of programmes from two sprays up to the four spray, four, four spray programme. The highest yields were achieved by some of the more intense programmes, so the Blockbuster, um, the Entrant 10 here achieved the highest yield at 11.5 tonnes per hectare, and also Entrant 13 and Entrant 7. In this case, most fungicides programmes did significantly increase yields compared to the untreated. And if you look at those top four fungicide programs, interestingly in this trial, they all use a slightly different approach. So the first was entrant 13, um, and you can see they dropped the T0 and went for a three spray program. In second was a four spray program from entrant seven. In third was a three spray program, but they dropped the T3. And in fourth was a two spray program. And entrant nine was actually the cheapest program of the trial, but spending 70 pounds. Entrant seven, the fourth spray was more expensive at 136. You can see that did end up in a higher yield with 11.44 to 10.95 with entrant nine, um, but they balanced out. Uh, they spent a, a spent less, sort of balanced out and brought them up into the top four. And in this trial, we saw a range of costs from 70 pounds up to 176. Um, but in this trial, we did see that the highest yields were achieved where the product had good efficacy against yellow rust was used at T2 or T3, which is what makes me think there was a bit more yellow rust in the crop than what we saw. Um, as you can see here, we've got a large serum at 14 and some uh, tebiconazole in the form of legend at T3. So at this site, I'd say the high input strategies achieved the highest yields. Um, as I said, the biggest yield response is where we saw good efficacy against yellow rust of, of products being used. But overall, a moderate spend achieved the highest margin. And actually, yeah, four quite different strategies um, got into the top four. So it's all about balancing your costs against your potential. Finally, our Southwest, kindly hosted by Ashley Jones. Again, the Southwest, um, back in the west of the UK, a high rainfall area. So again, septoria is probably the main disease over there. And it was in this trial. It was a crop of sky spray per on the 23rd of October. And overall, septoria was a lot lower than you'd normally expect, given the season. But it did start to increase later in the season uh, due to some rainfall in June. I should say this site did suffer from drought and it was quite patchy across the trial area. So this did create some variation in the yield results, and as a result, they're not statistically significant. But I think we can still take some conclusions from this. Um, you can see the majority, well, actually all fungicide programmes, increased mar uh, yield compared to the untreated. There are quite a range of programmes. Most went for a three-spray programme, um, with a couple of two-spray programmes in there. Entrant 4 did win with the highest yield, um, but may have got a bit lucky with the location of their plots. But if we look at those top four fungicide programmes, Entrant 4 was also the cheapest spend with the programme um, of three applications with no T0. Entrant 12 also used three applications. Entrant 10 was slightly different. They had a T1 application, and then they applied a T2.5, so a delayed T2, um, as they can see that Septoria was low. Uh, so potentially gave a bit more persistence later in the season. And that seemed to have paid off coming up in the top three. 
and then at drip 15 again use a three spray program and these range from 97 um, was the cheapest up to 176 was the most expensive in this um, but generally you see the yields between these three are fairly um fairly close the highest yield would be natural four but again the margins are fairly similar so for this trial, we saw that yield was influenced by disease and water availability in particular. Um, we saw a small yield response from fungicides, but again, a low spend on fungicides achieved the highest margins. I briefly want to touch on the sort of correlation between yield and total spend that we've seen from these trials. So this first trial now is from 2019. Uh, this is the first trial we ran for this program. It was in Herefordshire on a fertile land in, in Graham again. And it was a higher pressure season. We saw quite a bit of disease in this towards the end of the season. And you can see in this case, as you increase your total spend, the yield increased gradually and then plateaus at about 12 tonnes per hectare. As guess what you'd normally expect to get or hope to get, your fungicide starts to, to pay it back in the form of yield. The average end of spend on the actual fungicides in this case was £91.65. We then look at our sites for 2020. You see Wales and West and South West much more sporadic and no clear correlation. Um, so Wales and West spent £77 and South West £87. So overall, um, due to the lack of disease, really, you can see there's no correlation as such in the season. In East Anglia, there's perhaps a slight correlation, although it's still quite messy. Essentially, it's just we had, yeah, due to that bigger yield response that we got at that site. Um, and again, the entrance spend here was 78 So inclusions for 2020 were it's a difficult season to design fungicide programs. It's always difficult to decide how low to go um, and where to start cutting the costs. But overall, the best margins were achieved with low to moderate fungicide inputs. Um, an average spend on fungicides were less than 2019. They really excuse me, <laughs> highlighted the importance of knowing your fields um, and using that local knowledge. So you know you know what diseases you're, are a threat on your farm. You also know what yield potential your crop can get to um, and using that knowledge to balance your costs uh, is really important and that's all i had to share on that thank you chloe and we'll segue straight into to mark topliff like i mentioned earlier mark's got the the, the huge task of analyzing all the crop bench, the, the crop bench what age am i in farm bench data that that comes in um, for for hdb and mark's just going to show us in terms of um fungicide spend how how the relationship sits for for this huge data set so mark if i, if I just hand over to you and chloe's driving the slides for you thanks richard yes uh, if you uh, next slide please chloe so what, we, what we've shown here we, 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 we've taken a snapshot of the uh, the data coming out of farm bench and, and farm bench now is, we've got something approaching 2000 wheat enterprises that uh, we use in the benchmarks now for for farm bench across the last three years so this chart is these all these dots represents an individual wheat enterprise result um, and what we've done here we've, we've decided to plot similar to what um close has shown you really uh, this this looking at yield versus fungicide spend per hectare so um these dots you can see that they're quite well spread out um, I've even sort of included sort of David, Mark and Tom's um, results that we've got uh, as well on top of those. So you can just see how they, they sit in relation to the rest of the, the country. Um, so the, the relationship between yield and fungicides here, it looks, looks, doesn't look very strong, really. We've got a very uh, sort of spread out series of dots here. If we had a very strong relationship between the two, those dots would be much closer um a longer sort of trend line um but it's there's a, there's a very slight positive correlation between the two so slightly higher yield if you if you increase fungicide spend but but that interaction between the two isn't isn't a very strong one according to this data that we've got in in farm bench and you can see if you look across um maybe the the 100 pound per hectare fungicide cost uh, that you know there's been a range of yields that have been achieved at that particular cost so probably backs up what's been said already it really depends on your own circumstances really what's what's best to spend uh, on your uh, particular farm um, to achieve what you're trying to achieve in terms of yields uh, and output 
Um, certainly from what we're seeing in farm rates, it doesn't seem to be a very strong relationship between the two. Uh, next slide, please, Chloe. And similarly, if we take uh, net margin as before any rent and finance is, is, is costed in, and again, plot that against fungicides, uh, probably not unsurprising once we've seen that other slide that actually, again, there's there's a wide spread of these, these results, these spots. Uh, so there's no real correlation between the two really in terms of those uh, two aspects. Um, so again, you can see the sort of range as well in the net margins that we see in the farm bench results, um, uh, which is which is quite a, quite a, quite significant really. Um, so this is uh, really just giving a feel really those those relationships uh, and maybe what we think uh, that there's you know there's some drivers between one or the other. We, we're not seeing it in the in the data that we're seeing it in farm bench. Next slide, please. I thought I'd just uh, finish with looking at some input costs, and uh, if we just bring up the uh, the trend lines for fungicide, herbicides, and seeds here, this is this is some data which DEFRA publish actually on a monthly basis, looking at the the trend in the price of these inputs. So it's the price of the products. So it's not the cost um, as, as applied to uh, to the crops. It's the price of the products. And uh, really, it's just to show and put into context, you know, why why we're talking about fungicides tonight and why it's uh, something we want to try and sort of control the cost on, is that the price of fungicides has has gone up, uh, and CTL has been mentioned previously, and in fact we've now lost that, and that was one of the major influences of the the fungicide price trend going up sharply at the beginning of uh, 2020, as you can see there. So uh, it would be difficult to see that trend coming down uh, and so probably looking at alternatives and how we can uh, look at cheaper alternatives or, or, or cheaper chemistry uh, to try and bring down the cost of some of these fungicide programs uh, is something that we we'll probably need to need to look at um, because I think it would be difficult to see that, uh, that trend coming down uh, anytime soon. So that's all I've got to show. Uh, just gives you a very quick snapshot of the uh, the farm bench results and, and fungicide costs within it, uh, and what the current price trends are doing. Perfect. Um, just before we kind of segue straight into the to the Q and A session, I was going to ask Mark there. What Mark would, um, what what conclusions do you take from that in terms of the the cost relationship? I think it clearly shows that there's no direct relationship. Spending £200 on, on fungicides doesn't guarantee you a 11 or 12 tonne a hectare crop. Uh, it's about targeting it. The one data point that I picked out was somebody had spent about £220 a hectare on fungicides and grew an 8 tonne a hectare crop of wheat. So there's no guarantees of, of putting more on. So actually targeting. If you've got a, a crop that's got disease and is going to be prone to it, then it is worth spending that money. Whereas if you haven't got that yield potential, like our uh, fungicide trial we had last year, where there wasn't the potential, then there's opportunities to maybe cut back. So it's, uh, as was said earlier, knowing your farm and adapting to the season, to the weather, to the varieties and everything else. So there is potential to save yourself quite a lot of money. Thank you, Mark. OK, we've got quite a few different kind of variety of things coming in, so I'll try and try and keep it kind of um, succinct and, and to the point. So we're going to go through a kind of a quick quick fire um, approach to this. Um, first question has come in um, for, for Tom, and then we'll go to Tom and then to Jonathan for his for commentary. Tom, it's gonna, someone's asked, are you seeing high levels of yellow rust in your susceptible crops um, in the ground now? I haven't, no, not at the moment. Um, even though they were slightly later drilled, but I guess, you know, what Jonathan's take on that is one to watch um, as we progress into the spring. Perfect, thank you. And to, to build on that to you, Jonathan, if, if somebody was, I've got somebody here who says that they are, they have seen quite high yellow rust um, already, what would be your advice regarding a T0 or a T1 strategy um, with with this, this approach? Oh, I think you're on mute, Jonathan. Certainly, the, the, it is out there. Um, people are finding it. We've been reporting it in Crop Action for a while. Uh, Elicit and Gleam uh, two varieties. I've seen it in Lincolnshire. Haven't seen as much further west. I think there was a bit of an east-west divide going on in that respect. Um, but in terms of 
what to do. I think if you are growing a variety um, that is yellow rust prone, um, irrespective of whether you've got yellow rust in it, I would be considering using an azole um, at T0 to keep it in check because the weather conditions between um, or through April more than any other time probably are most conducive to yellow rust. It's that cool, damp, uh, dewy mornings without frost that really favour um, yellow rust development. And we've often found where people haven't applied to C0 uh, but are growing susceptible varieties that yellow rust is in the crop um, and established come the time they get around to apply T1. So yeah, it's clear. If, you, if it's already in there, then your decision is already made, I think, regarding your T alt strategy. Uh, got a question the director was Mark Wood. What will protect, protect SDHIs more, a multi-site or a more robust rate of SDHI? And if so, would, and if the latter, would it be cost effective? I'm not a, um, an expert as Jonathan might be, but I would say uh, using them when they're needed and not just saying, right, I'm just going to apply two SDHIs regardless of the season. So that'd be my first thing. I naturally would go towards putting in some sort of other protection rather than just going for really high rates. So I'd be putting in a, a fall pet or something like that, a multi-site to try and help with that protection. But I'm sure Jonathan would have a more expert view than, than me as a farmer. Nothing. Yeah, uh, adding more SDHI azole will not protect SDHI azole more. The more you apply them, the more you will select for insensitivity, insensitivity to them. So using, as Mark said, a different mode of action is the best way. Currently, that does mean really turning to uh, multi-sites at the moment. Um, as other modes of action come online, uh, we are expecting um, a strobilurin with activity on um, Deptoria in a few years time. We've also got a new activity in a QII from um, Corteva that is in a track that is due uh, that may be launched at some stage in the next uh, 12 months. Um, so there are other modes of action coming along but as Mark absolutely rightly said uh, at this point multi-sites are our only other strategy to help uh, slow the development of resistance. Question for Dave, um, as a grower of X days, could dropping a T0 or T1 be an option for, for, for you when septoria pressure is low? Uh, yes, definitely for me. Um, I saw very little disease in X days last year and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be at all concerned about dropping it this year if it's a, a low disease season, if it's chucking it down in April and May, then uh, probably not. But yeah, if you're not seeing anything in the field, I would uh, keep your product in the shed. Do you concur with that, Jonathan? Yeah, the only thing I'd watch out for is I'm, um, I'm not sure how well founded these are. I have heard of the odd report of yellow rust in X days at the end of last season. It may just be uh, an oddity that occurred right at the end of the season. Um, it is possible there's been race changes. Keep an eye on that element. I, I wouldn't shut your gate on um, disease control. Uh, just worth monitoring that. But absolutely, I think from a septoria angle, you can drop the T0. For a start, even on more, resist more susceptible varieties, you don't necessarily need a T0 perceptory. And I think um, there is scope with that variety to drop T1 as well in, in some circumstances. The bold question for Tom, it does that. A, a question for Tom, um, and this is just for, for a kind of general opinion. Someone here's asked you whether do you think that we're trying to grow too many cereals on poor quality, poor potential, high cost ground? Um, or should we be taking a more less is more approach um, with, with, with how we do this? Um, potentially, um, but as I alluded to earlier, you know, fungicides are only one part of the picture, aren't they? Um, but certainly longer rotation, you know, perhaps taking poor yielding areas out and they're going into an ELM scheme or ELS or something else, um, which is certainly what we've looked at. Uh, Question for Mark. Mark, if there are a few, if there are a few curative options, and Mark wants to reduce rates, how will he control disease if and when it gets away from him? Sorry, I didn't ask that very well. Um, I'd start if as we lose them, I start planning my 
fungicide strategy before I even plant the crop. So if we are losing the battle against septoria, that will take um, uh, precedence over our sandy soils and having to plant early. So we'll start planting later, go for your X daisies and, and those sorts of varieties with a, a septoria rating of eight. So you minimize that that risk, the, the challenge of septoria that you're going to be facing. So um, it's like with uh, our planting, um, we delayed our planting because we'd lost deter. So that became a key thing that we couldn't go early planting. So you adapt and it's no different with fungicides. So you, you mitigate those risks through integrated farm management uh, rather than just relying on that chemical and reduce what the chemical's got to, to face as a challenge. Jonathan, there's quite a few questions coming in here asking about mixing varieties and whether you have an opinion on on obviously there was some old work done done on that in the past and it's just a question that i kind of see from the threads here that's going to coming up again and again what are your thoughts on on that in relation to disease pressure yeah there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't mix varieties from a practical management perspective but from a disease pressure view it can help a little um i don't think the the difference you'll get is huge because um, when you mix a susceptible and a resistant variety, um, you will still get disease on the susceptible variety. The conditions in that crop will still be um, conducive to disease. There probably just won't be quite as much inoculum spilling around. Um, so it can, I think any benefit is likely to be quite small though. It can often confuse exactly what you do because you then have to treat all diseases because you've got varieties that are susceptible to all diseases within that mix and it's certainly no, no cure all it could have some small benefits so the next one's to the to the whole panel so i'll see if any of the farmers raise a hand to see if they want to answer this and then um then go to jonathan for his views what are the panel's views on using elemental elemental sulfur as a fungicide there's some research that implies that plant families um, produce sulfur as a localized component of act, uh, active defense to pathogens. Anybody brave enough to give an opinion on that? Uh, I, I, Thank you. I would say it's, you, I, personally, I'd like to see the re research. Yes, it, it's always been a, uh, one of the oldest um, fungicides out was sulfur and it got used a lot in vines in Egypt and everything else. So yes, it's out there. You'd want it in a product that could be applied through your sprayer sensibly. It's very, it always used to be a very difficult product to apply and um, and you'd want to see that research that it was going to add to the, the program. Uh, Jonathan, any thoughts on that? There are sulfur products out there. Um, there are fungicides. That are known to act as fungicides as mark said um yeah choosing products with the right particle size that have actually been designed as fungicides will make all the difference you need that product to spread on the leaf uh, and um, protect um, a large surface area so it's um yeah there are it is out there but um the level of efficacy i would put it behind um the existing remaining multi-sites in terms of activity on septoria and it's mainly septoria that's going to have some activity uh, Dave, if you if the whole farming population stopped using fungicides, what do you think would happen to dis with disease levels? Um, well, we certainly get more diseases, no doubt about that. Um, right, how bad they were would depend on the season. Um, it, it, you'd you'd also be farming on the untreated yield. Um, fungicide companies are out of business. Uh, we all have healthier bank balances probably because we aren't spending so much, but probably lower yields on the back of it. So net margin wise, we'd probably be worse off, I would think. Perfect. Um, Jonathan, breeders get questioned for price rises on new varieties with improved ge genetics, yet herbicides and fungicides would appear acceptable. What are your thoughts? Sorry, just run that past me again. I'm trying to read it. Breeders get questioned for price rises on new varieties with improved genetics, yet herbicides and fungicides would appear acceptable. What are your thoughts? Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure the comparison is one I, I can um, comment on, but I mean, certainly from a perspective of the egg again companies, they're spending um, hundreds of millions of pounds developing new chemistries, and they're incredibly clever at 
finding things that work that are reasonably safe for us to use and apply. Um, and um, I think given the risk that they have and the outlay that they put in, and to expect some form of return on their investment is it's not unreasonable. It, that allows them to reinvest and hopefully find us the next solutions. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on using Prochloraz to improve septoria control in early sown crops? Prochloraz, crikey, I'm going back a bit now. Um, Prochloraz um, has some high spot activity, has a low level of septoria activity. It's old chemistry, it's uh, unlikely to be around much longer. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't be one I'd be rushing towards as a solution. There. Don't think it has a great deal of rust activity either. So, you know, in terms of early season disease control, it's it used there was a point about seven or eight years ago where it seems we had a reversion to sensitivity to prochloras in the, in the septoria population. That went, came and went, and I, I don't think it's going to add a great deal. Um, anyone got any thoughts on the question? When spreading furt on a crop, can it damage leaf tissue to let in disease? Very specific. I would suggest you, like you've seen it with um, uh, when you're spreading liquid fertilizer, you see the scorch on the leaf. And I know the uh, companies that provide it, I won't name them, will always say, oh, it doesn't affect anything. But I'm sure um, uh, damaging green leaf area isn't going to help yield and is also going to provide a wound on that leaf to allow disease in. So I wouldn't want to be scorched, going out to scorch the leaf, uh, if at all possible. Mm. I'd, I'd agree with that. We use liquid fertilizer and have had, it's been bad the last two seasons with scorch. And it just seems, you know, when we're trying to protect that green leaf area with fungicides and then, it, you know, scorch a massive area of it with, um, with liquid, it must be having some effect, you would think. Tom, there's a few questions coming in. You and I did chat about this beforehand, so I'm going to kind of package them to direct towards towards yourself and it's about the relationship with an agronomist and there's there's one particular person here who's writ written kind of what questions can I ask my agronomist through the season and what kind of discussions can I have with them are you okay to just kind of talk us through kind of from from your experience how you work with your agronomist and kind of how you, you're obviously knowledgeable on the topic but how you use them to their best effect to, to manage your crop yeah I mean um, I think you know fungicides are only one element of what we're making decisions on um and to my mind an agronomist is more than just about making decisions about fungicides you know perhaps i should be paying more attention to my variety choices as have been highlighted here tonight but we're still managing to control that um and as part of an overall approach i, I mean i think i have you know we have an independent agronomist we don't have to buy the chemical from them um so that gives a degree of flexibility and a lot of the discussions we have are actually about not doing um, applications um, as opposed to chucking lots on. So it, it can work both ways. Um, you know, we have a discussion before each application timing we're coming up to um, and look at an array of costs and, and diseases in the crop. And, and make a decision from there. And I think the other point on the, the yield on the margin challenge that we did through ADAS um, is leaving that decision making process to as you know to the last minute can be quite helpful um if you're pre-buying products you know products that you can be flexible in the rates of so as you can you know affect your decision making process through the season to me i think is quite key rather than just going with a you know a planned strategy at the start of the year thank you tom i've got one for jonathan here oh god i'm going to try it there's, there's some language in here I can't even bring in to pronounce so bear with me um, accepting we have so accepting we have strong some stronger varietal resistance to septoria how comfortable would you be for a growth stage 32 leaf 3 timing to use a low dose of mifenfriconazole plus bulpet and save your SDHI combo for a T2 once you have seen whether the weather what the weather pressure is sorry I haven't read that very well at all uh, right, so it's all about using a low dose of um, Revisol and um, methane trifluconazole, is it? Yes. With full pet as a T1, and then going back, and then what, 
So with the second half, uh, that was plus full bet and save your SDH I combo for T2 once you've seen what the disease pressure is. Very specific question. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Um, with regard to, I mean, what they're using there is probably the most active, well, it is the, the most active azole we have on septorium. FN trifluconazole is the key active in Revisol. Um, it's probably going to cost quite a similar amount to the uh, mixture that is uh, methane trifluconazole and fluxoperoxide in Revistar. Um, so it's a, it's a rather odd combination to use at T1, I would say. Um, but yes, I mean, you could use that and it would probably be absolutely fine. It would be a strong enough on um, Septoria. It wouldn't have a great deal of rust activity, so I'd be a bit cautious on what varieties you did choose to use that on, uh, because in Revistar, the, the rust activity comes from the fluxoperoxide, perhaps more than the Myrisa itself. Um, but on Septoria, that would probably work. Um, I think the bigger question is whether you need a T1 on something like x -Days. Um On a variety like that, Septoria will develop very slowly, and you probably are going to have the top three or four leaves out well before um, Septoria has really gone up onto that canopy. Um, so you could argue for a for one-hit approach on a variety like that. Surely Jonathan's answer should have been what depends on what disease is present at the time of spraying as to whether it's appropriate. Absolutely, Mark. Uh, thanks for keeping me in mind. <laughs> right, I'm going to close the session with one one final question that I'm going to go to. It's been specifically asked to three farmers. And it's quite it's quite long. It's not a long question, but it's just your opinion. I've been doing HDB benchmarking for two years and I've always been accused of spending too much on fungicides. We farm in Suffolk on medium clay loams and found that in these dry seasons, our yields have been very good for our soil type. Plus our crops are staying greener longer than our neighbors, which I think is helping our yield. Do you think we are always getting return on our investment in our situation in these dry years or are we filling the pockets of the chemical supplier? Um, I'll do Dave, Mark, Tom. Uh, I think uh, I would always start a season by treating the crop in front of you and treating what disease is on it um, uh, and increase and decrease your rates depending on what you're seeing. Um, but if this, you know, if this guy's getting the yields and he's justifying the spend um, and, it, and, he, and he thinks that's been driven by his fungicide spend, it's not for me to say he's spending too much. If his crops are greener for longer and that's, he thinks that he's down to the fungicide spend on his policy, then that's why you keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Mark? I would, uh, the great thing about benchmarking is he can find out whether it is his fungicide spend. So if he's in a benchmarking group, uh, you look at it and you actually go and have a look at some of the other top competing farmers or people who've spent a lot lower. And is it, uh, is it the fungicide that's keeping it greener? Has he got a history of manures and better organic matters in the soils? There's so many other factors that can keep it green. But if he, if the factor, and do that bit of research, but if the factor is that he's spending that money on the fungicides and that's working for him, then he's 100% right. But I would just investigate it down using the benchmarking to identify a couple of other farmers, go for a little visit, COVID permitting and everything, and actually dig down as to why his crops are greener. Is Richard frozen? He looks like he's frozen, Tom, so oh, I should yeah. carry on. Oh, you know, agree with you on that, Mark. You know, there's perhaps lots of other things that could be affecting it. Um, but for me, that's what's been quite nice about being part of the fungicide challenge um, that work through ACB is that also gives you a chance to have a bit of a play around and probably be a bit more, um, a bit braver on some of those um, crops and, and have a go at um, using a lower input program and seeing how that goes. And, and obviously as that goes forward year on year, then we've got more data to, to back that up um, for the seasons. But I think, you know, Jonathan made the point earlier as well, not to be complacent through um, putting too little on. Yeah, I'll just say as well, that I'm not sure whether Richard invited me to, to contribute on this one, but I mean, what's too much one year can be too little the next. And we usually apply our fungicides before we actually know just what pressure we're going to get in the season. So it can be quite difficult to judge in the season where you need to be. Um, so, yeah, I would caution against, though, I mean, 
a benchmarking group in the last two years in two very quiet seasons for disease um, is undoubtedly going to have looked at that. And, and yeah, it may well be that in Suffolk in the last two years, you could have spent a bit less. The problem is you probably even will find that out by hindsight and you know, to massively reduce your input on the back of uh, that information might be exactly the wrong thing to do in, in 2021. Yeah. Jonathan, I've got a quick Perfect. question for you. Um, I think kind of... Go on, go, go on. Um, so the most challenging thing I think I had in the Villa York last year was uh, growth stages being all over the place in the same field on different soil types. In the, the, the clay land came out of a wet winter, badly rooted, and it just sat there in wet soil and just didn't move for ages. It just sat there at growth stage 30. Yeah, the other end of the field, and these weren't obviously, strictly speaking, uh, abiding to tram lines, uh, which would have been useful, but you were in the field, you know, free of draining soils that were, you know, shooting, flying away. So you had some, some part of the field uh, with leaf three completely out, leaf two coming out, and the clay lands, the uh, growth stage 30 sat there doing nothing. Um, so that, you know, that was really challenging to manage. And that continued right through the season. Um, so, you know, you got flag leaf out and you're still at leaf three on the heavy. Uh, what's, what would your advice be on managing situations like that? Uh, it's a very difficult one, David. There's no right solution. I mean, I mean, the, the whole premise of timing it by leaf emergence is, is a good one. Uh, but I think in circumstances like that, you just got to make sure your intervals are sensible and your treatments that you're applying are going to are going to work irrespective of timing. So you'd probably be advised at T1 and T2 then in a circumstance like that to be. Um, applying chemistry that's going to control the sectoria effectively. Um, it's not an easy solution. I think probably farming the best part of your field has got to be the um, key driver there, isn't it? Whichever part, whether it's the light or the heavy, that is looking like it's going to yield you the most. Um, but yeah, no, no easy solution on that. I think I'd watch out for your intervals if you've got, uh, uh, if it was your siskin. I mean, that's quite prone to yellow rust um, and you know, keeping, you know, more important than hitting the right leaf is making sure if you have got yellow rust around that you keep the interval to within three weeks. Tom, I'm going to come to you for the uh, closing question for, for our session, then then we'll, we'll call it a wrap. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, my question on that is to do with um, disease detection technology, um, particularly with septoria. Um, and to Jonathan or whoever else wants to chip in, um, how big a role do you see that playing and, and is that the future um, of enabling us to cut back our fungicide spend even more or to use the appropriate spend? I think it would be amazing if we had anything like that. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the challenge here is detecting disease that's in the leaf, but not actually visible on the leaf. Yeah, that was what because, I was getting at, yeah. Uh, if it can detect latent infection, uh, that can be quite interesting in that you would know uh, what level. But the, the difficulty we've got the most is actually quantifying that uh, in terms of uh, how much disease. There is work going on in this. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, this without actually taking a leaf and putting it through a PCR machine, uh, it's very difficult to judge exactly what that latent infection is. Now, you can do that in a small scale at the moment, but in terms of real-time information, I don't think it's available. Any other hey, thoughts on that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Perfect. I think my internet is crawling over the line, so I'm going to draw us to a swift close there, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to our panel and to our and to all of our speakers tonight, and I thank um, you to our audience really for 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 providing us with so much kind of varied content that everybody's going to hit hit head on um, this evening. As mentioned earlier, our our next session session is is next Monday evening. If you receive the invite to this, you receive the invite to to, to that. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for, for, for coming along tonight, and, um, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>